hi everybody and big welcome to a deck take video for Shurkai Genesis Engine. This deck has been brought to us by Pontus and as always in the description below of this video you can find a link to this deck list if you want to take a look at the card by card exactly how it's been put together. But also if you actually want to take a look and watch this game in action we have actually uploaded a gameplay video with it. But honestly, why would you consider building this? It only has two colors on it and it's the worst two colors on it, white and blue, which are definitely lacking a lot of combo potential. But the Genesis engine actually has a lot of cool things going for it. The biggest one in my opinion is that it's a white commander that is not a creature. It says right down there, Genesis Engine can be your commander without being a creature. Now, you might ask, why is that relevant? Well, it is because of humility. Humility is a great example of a CDH staple without being a CDH staple. So this card is amazing. Each creature loses all abilities and is a 1-1. One, one. It's a 4-man enchantment. It shuts down almost everything except underworld breach combos pretty much that that's the only thing that wins through this the only reason why humility isn't seeing play out there in the cdh game currently is because there isn't any single deck out there that can actually play it because every deck in cdh require a creature of sorts to combo off and win except this deck because this is not a creature it's an artifact. So even with a humility in play, we can still win the game with a Icy Cross Scepter and Dramatic Reversal. Unless you actually crew this and turn it into a creature. Don't do that. But with this, we will basically draw out our entire deck. And we're gonna get to how we're winning once we have our entire deck in our hand. But just to make something clear, once you're able to accumulate infinite mana and draw your entire deck, your win con could be anything. But we have a really cool win con coming up for you. Don't worry. The other cool card here is Skull Clamp, a great artifact in general, and here it is amazing, as your commander are creating 1-1 one, one colorless pilot creature tokens that you can Skull Clamp. So for only one mana and tap your Shurkai, and then spend one more mana to equip the Skull Clamp onto that creature, you're drawing three cards and discarding one card. That is a lot of accumulated value. Also, we have some really clean and efficient ways of tutoring Skull Clamp into play with the simple Enchantment Land Ursa's Saga. But let's talk a little bit more about Shurikai's ability in general. A great comparison to it is Thrasius. Four mana to scry one and then potentially draw a card or put that card into play if it is a land. Now, Thrasius' ability can be used over and over as it doesn't require him to tap. However, you don't normally do that because it's 4 mana, and if to activate him twice, you need to accumulate 8 mana, which is a lot, something you're not usually getting in a CDH game. Where in Shurikai's case, you're only tapping 1 mana and then tapping the artifact. You can also activate it immediately on the same turn you're costing it, because this is once again not a creature, it doesn't suffer from summoning sickness. Also, not being a creature, we aren't affected by a cursed totem, a great card for this deck, shutting down those annoying Thrasius mana dork decks. Thrasius also has cool things like Seedborn Muse, but we have Unwinding Clock. Untap all artifacts during each player's untap step. Untapping your commander, that is an artifact, and all your mana rocks to really dig for value here. And we really do need to dig because the Isochron Scepter and Dramatic Reversal combo is a combo that demands a form of setup. You need to acquire a bunch of artifacts that are capable of producing three colorless mana to go infinite here. One mana vault could literally do it. So in here, once again, Ursa Saga could help out here. So it's not impossible, but it's still a form of project to actually acquire this. But that means we're not on a form of turbo combo clock. We're more of a mid-range deck with a combination of both stacks that are great in this side the current CDH metagame and counter spells to really dictate the game flow. So the game plan is actually pretty straightforward. You want to have your commander into play as fast as you can with some mana rocks that are also going to be great with your Icy Conceptor later. But once you have your commander in play, it's card draw time, accumulating those amazing interactive spells to dictate and prevent your opponents from winning the game, stopping those turbo combo decks. But there's one more really cool thing. Let's go back to the commander's ability. Draw two cards, then 
the Skarda card. I mean, just imagine if we had access to the color identity of black. We would have been an amazing Rasakhev commander, especially considering the fact that we are producing tokens. The game plan would have been so cool. We are drawing cards, discarding Rasakhev to the graveyard, producing tokens, then reanimating Rasakhev, and then we're just popping off. Now, we can't do that, but we can do some other cool things. For example, Malevolent Hermit. We can easily discard this creature and then use the Disturb ability to bring it back from the graveyard as Benevolent Geist instead. One of my favorite flashback cards, and I often nag about this card actually. This is actually one of my favorite cards in the game. Flash of Insight. Two mana, then X. Look at the top X cards of your library. Put one of them in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library. That's not really that good. But the flashback cost is amazing. Blue, one generic, and remove X blue card from your graveyard from the game. We're going to accumulate a lot of blue cards in our graveyard. So X could be really huge here without paying a lot of mana for X. You're basically just paying an impulse from the graveyard, exiling a bunch of blue cards, and then drawing a card from that. We also have the white, very famous Savine's Reclamation. And I know what you're gonna say, we're not an Underworld Breach, so why bother with this one? It's still pretty good. Return target permanent card with convert mana cost free or less from your graveyard. We could re return an Icy Scepter that was destroyed. And I mean, it's not bad to have this in your graveyard as a option if you're getting into that really stalemate game where the grind value is key for victory. All of this really depends on your playstyle, on how you want to do this, how much you want to lean on to the graveyard thing. Another thing you could also start to lean on is the token production synergy. I mean, you could run an Elish Noon and turn all of your 1-1s into free freeze and this is a hate bear against your opponent's creatures as well, so it's good. I actually don't think it's good. It really turns it away from its original ID, being a mid-range, decent, interactive deck. Elish Noon is good in the more creature-based decks. Sure, we're producing tokens, but it's not guaranteed that you're gonna sit there and produce a lot of tokens. It is very easy to get an ID in your mind and get a little bit blind and forget about how efficient that actually is. This isn't bad, but I wouldn't recommend it. Going back to those graveyard shenanigans, I also recommend being a little bit cautious. I really like Flash of Insight because it's actually a card you could theoretically cast because there are gonna be games where you don't really have access to your commander and you don't get to sit there and activate it enough. And it's really bad to have a bunch of cards in your hand that would you would rather have in your graveyard so don't lean too heavily into the graveyard synergy stuff it's gonna be great and it's gonna synergize well for you but you don't want to be too commander dependent but now we have accumulated a bunch of value we have a lot of counter spells in our hand we have a lot of artifacts in play we're able to tutor or assemble the icy conceptor combo somehow we're able to fight through our opponents counter magic and all of that and we're able to accumulate infinite mana and we can activate this infinitely what are we going to do now? The answer is really simple. We're going to do Twister Loops. But to do that, you need Narset Partner of Veils, Time Twister, and Narset Reversal. You don't actually need to have Narset Partner of Veils, but it's something you really want to have, just so you don't need to sit there and communicate about potential interactions your opponents could draw into during the Time Twister Twister Loops. Because the master plan here, guys, is to cast Time Twister, but then hold priority and cost Narset's Reversal, targeting your own Time Twister. Narset's Reversal will resolve and go to the graveyard. And during its resolve, you're costing a copy of Time Twister that is shuffling your hand and graveyard containing your Time Twister in your hand and Narset's Reversal in your graveyard back into your library. Then everyone draws a new hand of seven, or well, only you draw a new hand of seven. This is the purpose of Narset Parter of Veils. It's kind of cool that we have Narset Parter of Veils and Narset's Reversal here working together. But the basic outcome of this is that you're shuffling back your entire graveyard into your library, and then with your infinite mana and infinite untaps from your dramatic reversalized conceptor, you basically just draw your entire deck again. With this, we can loop any spell infinitely and kill everybody with a lightning bolt. Now, okay, we can't actually do this because Lightning Bolt isn't in our color identities, but you get the picture. Instead, what we're gonna do is make infinite swan tokens. 
The trick here is that you cast a spell, a instant or sorcery or an enchantment spell, doesn't matter which one you cast. You hold priority on it and you cast Swan Song, countering your own spell. The outcome of this is that you are generating a 2-2 bird. So here we're going to make infinite 2-2 flying birds because we are casting this infinitely by looping it with a twister loop. And then we're going to pass the turn because what we're doing is actually a win con less win, which means we're going to set up a scenario where we can't lose and with our infinite 2-2 flying birds, we're basically going to win next turn. But also remember this, that your opponent's hand size are down to zero because we did have a Narset Parter of Veils in play during the Time Twister loop. Also, we have definitely cast Cyclone Grift about 27 times just to make sure. With this, we are basically returning all of their cards back to their hand, except the lands, of course. And then with the Narset Parter of Veils and the Twine Twister, we are sending all of their board states back into the library. While we are going to be passing the turn, keeping a perfect hand of seven counter spells in our hand, ready for whatever opponents are actually doing. And then when it's our turn again, we simply just attack them with infinite swans and win the game. That is the traditional way. You actually don't need to do this either, because you are in fact creating infinite colorless 1-1 one -one pilot during this twist the loop as well. You are still going to play Swan Song inside the deck, so you could still do this, even though you aren't actually going to do this. And the big reason why I kind of brought it up, even though I didn't need to do it, is just because I wanted to showcase how awesome Swan Song actually is. The last thing I want to say when you're bringing this command into some CEDH action is that you are a mid range deck. You should get your commander into play quite as fast as you can, because it's the deck's engine of accumulating card draw and value. But you are playing a control deck of swords with stacks and counterspell variants that is going to interact with variants of things your opponents are up to. And you are mostly going to go up against decks that are faster than this one. This is far from the fastest deck you could think of. This is a slow and stable mid-range deck for sure. But keep in mind that you do need to play the interactive game before you can start to set up your combo attempt. But also remember this, there's a lot of different variants out there of commanders that are doing just this. And in my opinion, the big reason why you're playing Shuriku Genesis Engine is because of that humility and that skull clamp. These two cards are your biggest reasons why this commander has a lot of really cool things going for it. That's it for this time. Take care guys, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what I do and you want to support me, feel free to share my videos or even checking out my Patreon page. Also, purchasing cards from the TCG Players website using the affiliate link in the description below of the video will also help the channel grow. So a big thank you to all of you.